The problem they have always had with us is irreverence. Irreverence is the act of making a joke about something that is normally considered to be serious. Being irreverent means you're not showing respect for something that is generally respected. Adults like to use this term as a pejorative. How dare these kids today not take school or work or the church or the government seriously? Now the trend of kids being irreverent isn't exactly new. As much as trad cons like to pretend that rebellion against the traditional order began its slow march only in the post-war era, Socrates is known to have famously said, the children now love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servant of households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs, and tyrannize their teachers. This trend may differ depending on the time period, the culture, the wealth or poverty of the society in which they live, but I think it's safe to say that the trend is real. It is in the nature of a child to be irreverent. I can already hear Sargon's voice echoing in my head. Not my kids, Dev. Well, your kids are still in that phase where everything revolves around the parents. When he's 12 and in the privacy of his friends, I'm sure he will say things about you that you'd never think he was capable of. And that's okay, because you did it in the privacy of your friends when you were 12 too. Every kid says, even if they don't truly mean it, my dad is a hard ass or my mom sucks, as long as they know they're not going to be caught. It doesn't mean that your kids hate you, it just means that they're growing into a more independent phase of life, and they're figuring out its boundaries. An attitude of irreverence is the discovery mechanism of this process. When you're a child, you're given rules. They're not only there to keep you safe, but to, broadly speaking, let you know what is good and evil in the world. The teen years, however, are when you test the rules, so that you may discover for yourself why something is good or evil. And sometimes, though rarely, you might discover that a rule is legitimately outdated, that what it guards against is no longer relevant, that the outside world has changed. For example, it made sense not to eat pork and shellfish in an era of foodborne parasites and diseases, but in practical terms, that's a problem we've largely figured out nowadays. I am going to stress though, testing the rules and discovering they need changing is a lot less common than most teenagers think. The 90s and 2000s was an era where irreverence was really considered a positive quality. Yes, you had the anti-war, free love, commune dwelling hippies of the 60s and 70s. They were certainly irreverent and garnered their fair share of scorn from the previous generation. But appreciation for those values and aesthetics that made those decades only came about after their time had passed. To contrast, the 90s and 2000s knew exactly what they were, while they were, and it was irreverent. The trend certainly got its start in the late 80s, where popular culture began to push child and teenage protagonists who genuinely did not give a flip about normal responsibilities, instead opting for hijinks and adventures. Bye. But it was the 90s where everything became that, and every kid wanted to be that. Who didn't want to be a teenage superhero? School seemed like an institutionalized joke designed to rob us of our youth, and adulthood seemed like a gap that we would never be able to bridge. Of course, everyone bridges it eventually, and as I mentioned in a previous video, if people's politics change over time, they're more likely to drift more rightward than anything else. However, this doesn't happen exactly the same way all the time. When the conservatism of age begins to bloom, it grows out of the compost of the values held in youth. Those hippies eventually became my generation's parents, the dreaded boomers. And sometimes it's hard for me to square away in my head that today's older Karens were the same people putting flowers into rifle barrels. While the hippies certainly had their socialist positions, they were also staunch individualists in their rejection of the traditional religious collective order. The GI generation enjoyed the Roaring Twenties, suffered during the Great Depression, and then fought in World War II, running the gamut from progressive overindulgence to societal collapse to conservative responsibility. Meanwhile, my generation, the millennials, largely rejected the neoconservatism typical of the 90s, from the religious like Pat Robertson, to the censorious like Jack Thompson, to the corporatist like George Bush, to the insane like Jack Chick. And as millennials are aging now, they are expressing their own form of conservatism. And if the exploration that characterized their youth was steeped in the worship of youth's own irreverent quality, their conservatism seems to be the complete rejection of irreverence. Call me a killjoy, but I think that because this is not to my taste, no one else should be able to enjoy it. The 90s is known for the creation of three unique types of irreverence. The first is gross-out humor, snot and shit, farts and burps, throwing up and weird foods and all manner of tie-dyed mystery slime. This was the humor of the young millennial kid. Meanwhile, kids who were a bit older may have had the opportunity to enjoy the second type of irreverence, which was less visceral, the sarcastic comedy. Consider the Simpsons, South Park, or a bit later on, Family Guy episodes of the era. Every joke was allowed. Every topic could be made fun of. Every curse word and slur was uttered. 
even if only past the watershed. Yeah, some of them were bleeped, but we knew what they were saying. And beyond just cartoons and comedies, do you think this scene in Die Hard 3 could be made now? Certainly not, but I don't recall people saying it was racist back then. In fact, the point of it is that McLean isn't racist. He's forced into this situation under threat of a bomb going off. And the point of the scene, for our purposes outside the movie, is that the 90s had a blanket default assumption of non-racism. And he's breaking that assumption openly and explicitly against his will. And so, we laugh at the situation. People weren't really screeching and demanding inclusivity and diversity and all the other buzzwords we hear today back then. General goodwill among your common citizen was assumed. The griller meme was the reality of this era. Yes, there were still racists, but they were reviled for their stupidity. And when we noticed them, we called them racists and others actually understood what that meant because we didn't just throw around that term wantonly, using it to describe anybody and everybody who disagreed with our views, diluting it to the point that it was no longer useful. Thanks for that, progs. While The Simpsons has turned into a shambling corpse that should have been cancelled 20 seasons ago, and Family Guy is now run by people openly admitting that the old episodes are so edgy that they're ashamed of them, South Park continues to be irreverent, even though the era of 90s irreverence has been replaced by the progressive puritanism of the current year. Soccer moms back then were screaming that South Park was turning their kids into little sociopaths, with those irreverent depictions of Jesus and Satan, and how Saddam Hussein was hanging around in hell, and how Kenny violently died every episode. Woke scolds now are screaming that South Park's continued irreverence, but now towards modern views of transgenderism and social justice, mirrors that old outrage. It's kinda like how conservative Christians burned Harry Potter books before, and leftoids burned them now. These are both ultimately puritanical reactions to the liberal values of free speech, just coming from the left instead of the right. And this is where we get to the core of the matter. Equality before the law, consent of the governed, freedom to speak and to choose and to think, these things require a certain degree of irreverence. We must be able to make fun of public figures and speak controversial things for a liberal society to function. Irreverence is not only the culture of the 90s or the method by which the youth define themselves, it is also one of the mechanisms by which a free society is actually free. Which is why the woke scold millennials of today, in reacting against irreverence, also ultimately end up reacting against freedom itself. South Park was where I first figured out this connection between the woke scold aging, and neo-puritanism. I'm a millennial myself. I am also aging, you Zoomers, but I still enjoy irreverent humor, which is probably the reason why most SJWs my age think I'm childish. And sure, I'm always going to be a kid at heart. I think that's even healthy on some level to retain youthful energy and optimism. But you know, I actually have grown up where it counts. I'm just still an irreverent person because it's a better, more free way to be. But the people who rebel against irreverence almost always shit out takes like this, eventually. Everyone recognizes that Gamergate was a practice run for the resurgence of fascism, but we don't talk enough about how there's a straight line from South Park to the kind of online white nationalist humor that gradually became not a joke at all. When I was a kid, the notion that everyone who was ever offended by anything was an idiot had common currency, and fortunately all my friends eventually realized that was wrong, but a lot of people didn't and those people are now Nazis. You can see it, can't you? Now that you've heard me ramble about the 90s and irreverence for a while, can you see what I see in this passage? This person is reacting against the pop culture of their youth and decrying others who haven't, in their view, grown up. Even though the 90s were culturally, literally so close to the liberal idea of fairness and freedom that abandoning irreverence means regressing back towards Puritanism. Their only option to salvage this garbage position is to say that the irreverence didn't belie a generalized rebellious attitude towards authority, but instead, a latent fascism. Since to be irreverent to the current progressive modern culture cannot be framed in any other way if they want to maintain a semblance of a moral high ground. Just as D&D players had to be Satan worshippers and gamers had to be school shooters, people who like edgy jokes have to be Nazis. It's all out of the Puritan's handbook. In retrospect, it seems impossible to overstate the cultural damage done by South Park, the show that portrayed earnestness as the only sin and taught that mockery is the ultimate inoculation against all criticism. You have, once again, missed the point. What South Park teaches is that everything can be mocked and that it should be. There should be no sacred cows everyone gets their turn. It's a shame Ed Sheeran didn't figure it out, but don't worry, I'm sure he got over his life being ruined with his millions of dollars. That third type of 90s irreverence that I skipped over earlier, alongside gross out humor and sarcastic comedy, it's probably best described as extreme slapstick. From prank shows like Punked 
to stunt and injury shows like MXC, this type of media was a mixture of real, caught-on-camera style footage with the choreographed stunts of a traditional movie. In other words, you were watching action, but it was real. Skateboard crashes where people really lose a tooth or break a leg. Actual fights and arguments generally accompanied by a live leak logo in the corner. Real pranks and trolls on unsuspecting people. What links all of these things together is authenticity. Jackass is considered the pinnacle of irreverent culture, as it combined all three types. Gross out, sarcastic comedy, and extreme slapstick, all in one movie. I'm actually really surprised that a fourth Jackass movie is on the way, because just as soccer moms back then said it was inappropriate, woke scolds today are probably calling it problematic. Within the past year or so, I recently rewatched all three Jackass movies with friends, and all I could think throughout them was, there's no way this would get made today. Everything's gotten so much more repressive since the old days. MXC, same thing. There's actually a Twitch channel where all the episodes of MXC are aired on repeat, and I'm surprised it's still up, because every time I tune in over there, there's immediately a joke that would never fly on the internet today. I guess Twitch just hasn't realized it yet. Uh, we've had reports that one of our prisoners is missing, but don't worry, Guy is on orange alert and nothing will get by me, Guy. Hmm? Hey, baby doll. <laughs> oh, Guy likes. There's a million other examples as well, like advertisements for video games that are overtly sexual or disgusting by today's woke standards, but they were just normal back then. Edge sold, simple as that. And even as the edgy era began to fall out of touch, game companies continued to use those same tactics, right up until it got them cancelled by the game journals of the day. Spike TV, the well-known network for men that pioneered MXC, also aired many similar types of shows, stuff that was steeped in all sorts of irreverence. The early internet also mirrored this attitude, from 4chan to YTMND to Newgrounds. With E-Bombs World stealing it all, it was all edgy content. Even though Urban Dictionary is heavily wokeified nowadays, it was a bastion of edge 20 years ago. And occasionally some prog will find an old entry and kick up a big stink on Twitter about how people used to use the slang gay fart to describe a fart that smelled of cum. As the internet's earliest content creators got off the ground in the mid to late 2000s, the reverence culture was still in full swing, and it showed. Tourette's guy is amazingly, hilariously offensive. It's a guy who does skits, acting like the worst possible stereotype of somebody with threats. This is the kind of stuff that went viral back in 2006. Angry Video Game Nerd also got his start in this era, and is also a show based in a reverence culture incessantly screaming curse words about old Nintendo games, and even real-life prank calling a hardware store and reviewing Atari porn games in early episodes. James Rolfe would never do that shit nowadays. And I personally have extremely vivid memories, it's been totally scrubbed off the internet by now, I'm sure, of a Doug Walker video, that guy with the glasses, Channel Awesome, five-second movie review of Batman and Robin, and all it is is a video of his ass hovering over a toilet while a shit log falls out of it. Wait, 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 this is the dev of the future while editing the video. I found it on the internet archive and it's just how I remember it. I'm not gonna put it in the video, I don't wanna get banned, but it's in the description. And holy shit, literally. The ethics of irreverence really does boil down to everybody gets a shot. Every skater kid gets to try the jump. Everyone gets laughed at when they fail, praised when they succeed, and given their due for taking a shot regardless of outcome. Everybody gets pranked and everybody laughs, knowing full well that tomorrow they will be pranked by today's victim and laughed at. Everybody gets a slur thrown their way, knowing that it's all in jest, understanding that differences exist but not letting them divide or define. A logical good fit with this ethic is the gamer space, a community that's competitive and rowdy by its very nature, but ultimately inclusive as long as you can game. You can smack talk somebody's race or gender, but in the end, the leaderboard doesn't lie. Today's woke scolds and rejecting the ethics of irreverence reject the fairness, the humor, the camaraderie, and the competition. Where Gamergate began as a gamers are dead styled rejection of gamers by the anti-gamers who weaseled their way into power within the gaming space, what Gamergate actually was underneath all the accusations of sexism underneath the culture war was the first real push of the rejection of irreverence, and this has finally been directly said, laid out for all to see eight years later. Here's a Facebook comment that went viral. It boggles my fucking mind how we lost gamers to the right. Capitalism is the biggest cause of the decline of gaming. Microtransactions, loot crates, pay to win, selling games piecemeal, charging full price for garbage that'll get fixed later, relying on modders, monopolistic growth relying on removing competition. Gaming is a microcosm of the failures of capitalism, and all gamers think is, look how feminism and diversity is ruining my video games. This is actually a somewhat reasonable critique of some of the problems with gaming right now, but the even more viral reply to this post is jaw-dropping. I'm not going to read it all, it's like a 100 tweet thread, but the full thing is in the description and worth seeing in detail to understand the brains of these people. 
when was the last time you saw a left-wing gaming clan? The reactionary politics is baked into the mechanics, and they're exposed to it at increasingly younger ages, where their primary social contact is with people who get them to enforce hierarchies of competition. Competitive games are designed to attract people who like conquering. Why do you think 4X games are so prone to fan bases who are viscerally reactionary gamers? It's in the genre definition. 4X is a colonialism power fantasy. They're on the front lines of the excess of capitalism. The only message they receive is, when my guy was in, things were fine. Now I have to be the guy or make the guy. They need a despot to rule them and tell them what to do, because their entire social hierarchy depends on it. If leftists want to convert gamers to leftist politics, they have to do on-the-ground advocacy in an engaging way via clans, esport teams, and larger communities. However, that will always struggle against the fundamental mechanics of these games that select for this behavior. With the lens of woke scolds reject the irreverence of childhood and the ethics behind it in mind, go back and listen to that passage again. Do you see what she's saying? Competition itself is problematic because the type of person that is competitive rejects the mass equality of socialism and prefers to climb hierarchies of merit. And because games are about challenges to overcome, enemies to vanquish, lands to conquer, princesses to save, puzzles to solve, they will always be challenging, they will always be hierarchical, and they will always be problematic. Gamergate was always about a hatred of games. The hatred of gamers was icing on the cake to these people. As for why hate games, I can only speculate. But if I had to guess, it would be that a well-adjusted adult is somebody who, as a child, engaged in play, both solo and with others, and was socialized by that play. If you want to create damaged, subverted and undisciplined adults, you must subvert their play. Subverting games is one very popular vector to do this with, but they're using Gramsci's playbook everywhere with the same goal. Understanding irreverence, how it was the youth culture 20 years ago, how it's being rebelled against now, and why they're rebelling, explains every single prog movement and talking point since before Gamergate. And the reason I've decided to do this video now is because of the recent G4 debacle. G4 launched in 2002 with the express purpose of competing with tech TV, but with programming aimed at MTV's demographics, teens and young adults. And like MTV, it was inundated with irreverence culture. And while its programming revolved around video games, computers, and technology, its tone and style stuck to the skits, pranks, rude jokes, and sex appeal that was popular at the time. By 2006, the channel had to broaden its focus to attract viewers. By 2009, the channel was experiencing significant cutbacks and layoffs. And by 2014, the network completely closed, having been entirely replaced by YouTubers and streamers online. But nonetheless, G4 is remembered fondly by its fans, with its flagship show, Attack of the Show, still adored by gamers. G4 relaunched on YouTube last year, and their channel is dead. It's a graveyard. They've got half a million subs, and they get the same views that I do. Meanwhile, they've got 20 people on staff to pay for it all, plus all their very expensive looking sets. I can't imagine this thing is making any money. So when your failing revival of an already failed brand is failing to compete against the people who replaced you a decade ago, is about to sink again, what is your business strategy? Is it to blame the people who should have been your viewers, the people who remember G4 as a part of their childhood or teen years? Would you be surprised if the answer to that question is a resounding yes? But I actually want to talk about something so much more important than Red Dead Online. Sexism in gaming. In joining G4... Yes! In... This is not where I thought we were going, I know, but I'm here. I have no here. idea. I'm listening. Yeah. Oh god, do you really need to talk about sexism in gaming some more? This is a conversation we've been having since a full fucking decade ago, where Zoe Quinn cheated on Aaron Joni with two full Greyhound buses worth of people. And the conversation always goes like this. You suck, your show sucks, and that's why you get vitriol. That's it. Every time G4 is brought up in various channels, even in this YouTube channel, we have the chat in front of us, I can see you, without a doubt, there will be backlash because I'm not as bangable as the previous host. It's somehow- Talk to him, Frost! It has somehow been expected that you can talk about how much you jerked off to women as a compliment. That's it's weird. not a compliment. It's weird! I'm gonna go ahead and be the contrarian once again and say, you know what? Disregarding her personality, of course, that's a pretty big thing to disregard. This girl is actually kind of cute in her own way. The blonde, short-haired, petite girl is certainly a type. It's why so many people were fapping it to Kess on Voyager, that psychic chick from Judge Dredd. Suicide Girls was full of tatted up short-haired blondes, and this look was for a time incredibly popular. Though maybe this is just me showing my age because the appeal of Suicide Girls was downstream from a reverence culture. Um, for you Zoomers out there, Suicide Girls was basically a porn site that exclusively catered to alt girls with tattoos, piercings, and punk hairstyles. In an era before video streaming, your choices were buying porn DVDs or porn off satellite TV, downloading porn videos from Kazaa or LimeWire, or looking 
looking at pictures. And the only place that was doing alt girls was Suicide Girls. And fun fact, that's where Zoe Quinn posted her nudes back in the day too. My point is though, I know very well the aesthetic she's appealing to. And she does look like she could have made a few bucks on that site back in the day. Give yourself a bit more credit, girl. Women do not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Morgan Webb, Olivia Munn did not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Oh no. Oh no. Roll the clips. Sexism in gaming. Here we go again. Morgan Webb, Olivia Munn did not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Oh crap! Just roll it. Sexism. Objectify women. Hate women. Sexist. Sexism. Woman. Half of our producers and writers are women. Okay, first of all, Now, this is not a regulation no, dog, well, so you're no, raw dog really, in here. It's really thick. What makes this funny as shit is that this is exactly why these women existed. It's why when Olivia Munn made the jump to The Daily Show, she lasted for a few skits before disappearing and nobody even noticing she was there. It's why Morgan Webb hasn't done a single thing of note since G4 died. Hell, I know this ain't G4, but back when the first Assassin's Creed dropped in like 2006 or whatever, and Ubisoft decided to push the whole Jade's game angle, it's why the comic of her sucking off all the nerds went viral. Yes, clearly, women can provide more than their looks to the gaming space, but none of these women did, and our memories are too long for you to be able to rewrite history. And I wish I could turn the camera around so that you could see the incredible team that make X-Play. Half of our producers and writers are women. Emily, Abby, Megan, Joe, Jake, Zipper, Gabby. None of these people will be receiving a paycheck by 2023. And part of it will be because your content isn't getting any traction. But most of it will be because of the backlash that you're creating right now by attacking the only people who could have ever possibly be interested in watching you. When you're in our DMs or on those YouTube comments or in Twitch chat right now, those reactionary threads thinking that I'm somehow ruining your current X-Play experience because you can't objectify me how you previously did to Morgan, or that I'm somehow less qualified to speak on something, but you can't quite put your finger on why, even though I'm reading the exact same script as Adam, but you have no problem with he's part of it, you're letting your unconscious biases ruin my day and you're gatekeeping the gaming space. No, gatekeeping is good. I'm actually not doubting you're a gamer. I'm just doubting that you're a gamer I want to listen to. Like I said in the last video, you can't actually be gatekept from games. But now that you're screaming that banter, that the camaraderie of everybody getting their turn of being the butt of the joke, that the ethics of irreverence should not apply to you because you have a vagina, that is in fact gatekeeping on your part. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Peace. Yeah! You know what? Sounds good to me. Also look at her face after the camera's off her. Holy shit. That chat she's watching must be lacing into her for her stupidity. She can't take it that nobody agrees with her, and that she just very well may have tanked her own fucking show due to her ego. Also, look at Gerard over there. He's sitting like he's taking a shit into his chair. I know the Gerard of 10 years ago was not a woke scold like he is now. I wonder if that younger, slimmer Gerard is still inside the fat one, looking out at the modern world but unable to affect it, watching horrifically as his body is puppeted for these dark purposes. I began the previous video, that one about gatekeeping, with my own background because I wanted to make it known that I'm invested in the topic. My friend Arch, the king of gatekeeping videos, said on stream later that he didn't quite get it, that to him it sounded like I was complaining about being bullied. And fair enough, I don't actually think I brought it all together in the end like I wanted to. The point I was making was, in order for you to truly care about some hobby, some subculture, some community, you have to have that level of attachment to it. I'm not going to sit here and say it was like I got abused or something, but yeah, you got to suffer at least a little bit to truly enjoy something, you know? You got to take your lumps to be accepted into the group. But this? This is a woman who's clearly suffering, sure, but she's not taking her lumps, so she's not being accepted into the group. She's complaining about the lumps, and then complaining further about the rejection. It sounds strange to say it, but intuitively this phrase feels right. On some level, she's not a real gamer, no Zoomer can be, the way that we are, because they never got ostracized like we did. However, does that mean that ostracization is required to be a gamer? No, I don't think so. Maybe it's that she completely lacks respect for people who were ostracized. She got in on a free pass, and then complained about, and then later prolonged, the suffering of those who came before. Yeah, that's what it is. It's not that she's not a real gamer. It's that she has no respect for gamers who are not like her. Again, I'm not talking like this is some kind of racial oppression level of suffering. That's just stupid. But we did get teased for being gamers and we grew from it. She didn't. And now that she is being teased, she's sulking like the children that we were. 
This new G4 isn't going to last. Watch their social blade over the next few months, after the spotlight moves on from them. We're already seeing the immediate loss of subs due to backlash, but after that levels out, I do also expect a slow abandonment of their audience and gradual decrease of views over time. The general gaming public does not give a shit about G4 anymore. They've long since been replaced by Twitch streamers and YouTubers. The only people who are watching G4 now are people who had fond memories of G4 from back then. And you just told them that their shit, the show they loved, is shit. The ethics of irreverence that made the show what it was are shit. And how they all need to grow up and get with the demoralization. You will not last. And the internet will be better when you're gone. I'm not even somebody who watched G4, but I'm willing to bet that, after viewing this shit show, old school fans are now nostalgic for that dark era during G4's decline where all they played were back-to-back -back reruns of Campus PD and Star Trek The Next Generation. Sexism in gaming. Women sexism. Women, women, bangable, sexist. Sexism woman. Jerked off to women, women. If you don't like it, don't watch it.